Well, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce today's speaker, who is uh, Felicity Jones, Dr. Felicity Jones, who's uh, coming to us from the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, uh, where she is a new group leader. She's been there for a year and a half. Uh, and I first uh, really took notice of Felicity's work. She's, she works on sticklebacks, as we'll hear about in, in a minute, uh, from a paper that she published in Nature in 2012. And I'm going to embarrass her by saying I think this is one of the finest papers in evolutionary biology published in, in the last uh, five or ten years. And if you haven't read it, you should. Uh, so in this paper, uh, they sequenced and provided a high-quality draft of the uh, stickleback genome uh, in the first two paragraphs of the paper, uh, and then moved on to more interesting things. Uh, and, and in that paper, they sequenced uh, marine and freshwater uh, fish from a number of places around the world <coughs> and looked for bits of the genome where there were parallel genetic changes, which provide a very, very strong signature of adaptation to freshwater environments. And they found a number of such regions. And among the many interesting findings uh, was the observation that uh, many of those regions don't contain genes. So it seems as if a lot of the changes are in regulatory regions. It's a phenomenal piece of work. And then if that wasn't enough, I also did a hybrid zone study in the same paper. Uh, to show that in individual river systems there was adaptation that seems to be due to different changes, so it's not all the same. Uh, so that's just one of many papers that she's uh, published. She uh, has an association, although an indirect one, with the MVZ, uh, in that she was an undergraduate with Craig Moritz uh, in Australia. So when she opens her mouth, you'll hear that she's from Australia. <laughs> uh, and she was an undergraduate in Queensland, and I didn't know that. I met her for the first time a year ago at a meeting in, in some small town up in the mountains in Switzerland on the genomics of speciation. Uh, and I said immediately, we've got to get you out to the MBZ for a talk. And so she's come all the way from Germany via Kansas, where she was just speaking last week at a, a an ecological genomics symposium. Uh, you did your undergraduate work with, with Craig, and then you did your uh, PhD at Ed Edinburgh uh, before doing a postdoc uh, with David Kingsley at Stanford, and then finally going, going to, to Germany. So we're thrilled to have you here, and look forward to hearing about your work on sticklebacks. Well, many thanks for inviting me, and many thanks for that gracious invitation. I'm going to tell you today about two other beautiful stickleback papers that were not done by myself, which far exceed um, um, the, the paper that I published. Um, today, uh, so, I've, so I've been in Tübingen for about a year and a half, and um, we are just starting to get the lab rolling, and I've got a number of different projects on the go. So today you might hear some kind of half unfinished projects, um, and I'll also talk a little bit about the genomics that we did um, in that 2012 paper. But I thought I'd start by introducing you to the Friedrich Michel Laboratory. So this is where I'm based in um, southern Germany in a town called Tübingen. Um, many of you may not be aware that Friedrich Miescher, um was the first person to isolate DNA from the cell. And he did this inside the kitchen of the castle in Tübingen. So this is the Tübingen Schloss. This is his laboratory. And um, he isolated DNA from the, um, from the cell, and his advisor did not believe him, and the results had to be repeated. Um, he left the lab. They got repeated five years later. The work was published. Um, all of that happened in 1869. And then 1969, the Max Planck Institute um, actually developed a small mini institute called the Friedrich Michel Labs, which is where I'm based. Um, we are inherently integrated into the Developmental Biology Institute, and we work in really fine buildings, no longer the, the castle kitchen. <laughs> um, so today, um, oh, actually, I should ask what the time is, so I know how much I've got to go. It's 12.15, so you have 45 Okay, yep. Um, so today, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing, looking at the molecular basis of adaptation and speciation. I'm motivated because I grew up in Australia, where we have lots of weird and wonderful critters. And I had to read textbooks about northern hemisphere species that I've never seen, um, but that got me thinking about why um, organisms evolve. Um, nowadays, some of the questions we ask are, um, what are the mutations that underlie adaptive traits in natural populations? Um, what are the molecular mechanisms and developmental processes that are actually mediating that, that um, phenotype? How do these um, developmental processes ultimately affect the phenotype? How does the phenotype interact with the environment and ultimately um, influence an individual's fitness, survival, and reproductive success? Um, we use a number of different approaches to tackle this question in my lab, and you're going to hear a, maybe a little bit of all of these today. Um, 
we use a lot of genomic analyses to identify loci in the genome that may be underlying adaptive um, variation. We do an awful lot of functional genetics at the moment to functionally test how these loci influence phenotype, environmental manipulation in a nice new fish facility, and then natural population studies to understand how that genetic variation actually mediates fitness and survival in the wild. For those of you who are not familiar with sticklebacks, I'll give you a brief introduction. These are small, five to six centimetre sized fish that live across the northern hemisphere in marine and freshwater habitats. The ancestral marine fish recently colonised a whole bunch of newly formed freshwater habitats which formed after the retreat of the Pleistocene ice caps. So that happened about 10,000 years ago. And assuming a stickleback generation time of one year, that's approximately 10,000 generations. Since that has happened, these freshwater forms have evolved into a diversity of different morphotypes or phenotypes. Some traits have evolved in parallel, so the freshwater forms tend to have lost their lateral plates down the side of the body. They have shorter dorsal spines, for example. Other traits are actually unique to each population. Um, as a community, we talk about stickleback species <coughs> pairs, and we use this term species pairs to describe um, divergent forms that coexist in sympatry um, throughout some part of their lives. So you may read literature describing um, lake and stream forms which differ um, considerably in morphology. The marine and freshwater ecotypes, which I'll tell you about today a little bit more. Benthic and limnetic forms, which coexist in a few lakes in Canada. And then also um, these divergent Japanese sea and Pacific marine forms, which um, are actually quite interesting. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how these different species pairs relate to each other. It turns out that the degree of reproductive isolation between the different pairs um, differs. So you can kind of see um, a trajectory towards strong reproductive isolation shown across this slide here. The lake and uh, stream pairs are very weakly reproductive isolated. They breed and hybridize happily. We also see extensive hybridization between marine and freshwater forms. In contrast, there's actually considerable reproductive barriers that separate benthic and limnetic morphs. And there's good genetic reproductive isolation, um, ex uh, genetic incompatibilities between the Japan Sea and Pacific marine forms. So you can kind of view, if you were to look across these divergent ecotypes, some trajectory towards um, complete speciation. But perhaps one of the most useful things about stickleback fish is that they've um, evolved repeatedly and oftentimes in parallel, and this provides us with evolutionary replicates. So just like you have replicate petri dishes in the lab, we've got replicate examples of these phenotypes evolving over and over again. And we can use those populations to ask for uh, one of the general processes that underlie this um, adaptive change. So um, you're probably already aware that um, sticklebacks are really great because we can do a lot of um, genetic crosses in the lab. They have large fertile progeny, um, large fertile crosses which we can then use for genetic mapping studies. Like zebrafish, they have transparent embryos, which make them quite tractable for developmental biology. We've got an increasing number of genetic and genomic tools, including transgenic techniques for both enhancer assays and reporter, um, reporter assays and knock-ins and knock-outs. And now, as a community, we've got an ever-increasing number of resequenced genomes um, for which we can study natural population variation. So today, I thought I'd break this talk up into three parts. I'll tell you about how we find adaptive low science sticklebacks. That kind of takes you through some of the um, genomics paper that, that Michael described. Some of the molecular mechanisms that we've learned about um, that might be underlying this adaptive divergence. And then a little bit at the end, looking at the comparative genomics of adaptive divergence in different species pairs. Um, OK, so <laughs> marine and freshwater sticklebacks differ in many different traits. If you were to go out across um, to your favourite river in the Northern Hemisphere, you would probably find a contact zone that looks something like this. In the lower red marine reaches of a river, you will find a stickleback ecotype that is quite robustly armoured and shiny and silver with long spines. The freshwater form is um, much smaller in body size, tends to be pigmented, shorter um, or less armour. But one feature to point out to you is that these two forms do come into contact and breed in sympatry in the lower reaches of the rivers, and actually hybridization and gene flow occurs here. And that's an important um, process that becomes relevant later in the talk. Um, right, so um, we use forward genetic mapping to identify the genes underlying traits that um, vary between different forms. 
An example of that is this beautiful study done by a PhD student in David Kingsley's lab a few years ago, Pam Colosimo. She actually did perhaps one of the most influential stickleback papers, I believe, where she cost, um, did forward genetic mapping between different plate morphs to generate a panel of F2 progeny, which was segregating this trait, and then could look for co-segregation of genes and traits and identify the region that underlies lateral plate morphology. Doing that, she got down to a large QTL interval of 100, several hundred KB. But taking advantage of natural populations where this trait varies um, within a population, so it's polymorphic, um, she was able to association map this region down to a 16 KB uh, haplotype block, which contains three genes, one of which was the ectodysplasin gene, EDA, which from mouse and human studies was a great, study, a great candidate for actually this phenotype, and she was able to then um, inject the cDNA from this gene into a fish which typically would be low plated, and show its function in plate morphology by rescuing the phenotype. This, I think, is um, a beautiful paper because it shows how you can use forward genetic mapping to go all the way down to a gene region and then functionally demonstrate how that influences a, an adaptive phenotype in natural populations. Since then, um, the stickleback community has been busy mapping many, many different traits. So this is a kind of crude slide that I've put together just representing just a subset of papers <coughs> done by various different research groups. It shows you the linkage groups across the genome and each of these bars represents the two body interval for a QTL that has been mapped. So many different traits have been now tied to different linkage groups across the genome. And um, I'm going to now transition back to the EDA story to tell you about the evolutionary history of the EDA gene because it sets up the um, pattern that I'll talk about later in the talk. So um, the loss of lateral plates in the freshwater fish has evolved repeatedly in many different populations. If you were to take those populations around the world and build a tree based on neutral markers such as microsatellites, you would see a tree that is consistent with isolation by distance. The fish from the Atlantic basin group together in one clade that's distinct from the Pacific basin, and this is independent of their plate phenotype. In contrast, if you build a tree from the Eda region, just using the Eda locus, all the low plated morphs group together in one clade that's distinct from the high plated morphs. With one exception here, which has proven to be quite useful, and I won't have time to tell you about that today. But um, the key message from this is firstly, different parts of your genome show different evolutionary histories. I think people are quite familiar with that idea. But to evolve the loss of lateral plates, um, you need to have, or well, the fish seem to have made use of the same genetic variation in many different populations from geographically disparate locations. And that's kind of a crazy idea that a fish in Europe had the same access to the same genetic variation that a fish in, say, North America did. And the model by which we think this happens is something we refer to as the transporter room or something like that. And I'm trying to show you that here in this, um, in this picture. You could imagine a scenario where a freshwater adaptive mutation arises in a freshwater population. Through these hybrid zones, which occur in the lower reaches of rivers, it's able to leak out into the marine environment where it hides at low frequency and then can be repeatedly swept to fixation in new freshwater populations. So if that's happening, you might expect to see in the marine fish um, at least some individuals who are carrying freshwater adaptive alleles. And Pam, back in 2005, did show that the low-plated freshwater eater allele was present in the marine population at appreciable frequencies. So we think that this um, mechanism of shuttling genetic variation through this pool of marine population might be quite important for the parallel adaptation in fish. Um, okay, so then um, around 2007, you know, Illumina released their first Selexa machine and things got quite exciting and we decided we could actually use the signatures that we see at the Eda locus to look for other Eda-like loci across the genome. So to do that, um, we sequenced 21 marine and freshwater sticklebacks from around the world, and we did this in a kind of paired-like fashion. We wanted to uh, maximize the opportunity for neutral gene flow between forms. So we tried to collect marine and freshwater pairs that were proximal to each other, but then to sample them from multiple different locations around the world. Okay, and we did that, and we analyzed the genomic data using two different statistical approaches. The first one was a, um, sorry, a hidden Markov model where as you move across the genome, we actually tried to assign each part of the genome to one of 20 possible tree topologies. 
and at the end of one lap of the genome, we would update those tree topologies based on the genomic data that has been assigned to them. So after several iterations, the trees start to change in shape in topology based on the genomic signatures that exist in the data set. The second approach we used was um, something that perhaps is more familiar, is just a genetic distance matrix approach, where basically between each of the 21 individual fish, we uh, calculated the pairwise divergence. And in neutral regions of the genome, you might see very little structure in this, data, in this matrix, but in parts of the genome such as EDA, like this matrix here, you can see strongly elevated divergence between marine and freshwater forms relative to their own ether types. And from that um, matrix, we actually can do many different um, analyses. We calculated a cluster separation score, which is a measure of the distance between marine and freshwater clusters after accounting for the variation within. Um, I wanted to point out that both of these approaches allow for unguided discovery of novel patterns in the genome. So this matrix clustering method and the hidden Markov has, a, has the potential to discover new groupings or population groupings within your data set. And although we tell the marine fresh water story because it's easy for people to think about, both of these approaches have re revealed other parts of the genome which show very different clusterings of populations. And so it's a kind of reverse ecological genomics approach. We can then look at those new novel clusters and ask what do those fish share in common um, and what might that genomic region be doing. A very brief example of this kind of data which I put on a um, genome browser in a computer in Stanford um, is this representation where I put all 21 fish in either cluster 1 or cluster 2. Based on the results of this um, unguided clustering approach, you can see that there's a region of the genome where these blue fish group together in cluster 2 that is distinct from all the other fish. And so, I mean, I, I wanted to point that out because we often talk about just the marine freshwater story, but I think there's something appealing about using an unguided data-driven approach. Okay, so um, when we actually look at the, the marine freshwater divergence, the parallel pattern of divergence, if you look at any given chromosome, this is one of our favorites in the community, which contains this eta locus. You can also see other peaks of marine freshwater parallel divergence, which we previously had no idea about. And if you zoom in on some of these, just to give you a feel for the underlying data, um, I plotted the raw genomic data along the um, bottom here, and I put all the marine fish with the most frequent allele in the marine population as red, and the alternate derived allele as blue. So as you move along this window, you can see a region where freshwater fish contain a haplotype that's distinct from marine fish. That's basically what's being captured by our statistic up here. And the resolution on these signals is actually extremely high. So these are 5 kb or 20 or 40 kb. These are all imminently clonable or um, usable in transgenic tests. And that's what a large proportion of my lab right now is working on. Okay, so across the whole genome we see patterns like this where we've got um, marine freshwater signals of divergence um, on almost all chromosomes, which is surprising given that we're talking about parallel evolution. It means if you wanted to evolve to a new freshwater habitat, you would have to collect the freshwater adaptive alleles from all of these loci and put them together to be able to survive. And that seems inherently improbable and not so parsimonious, but that's the pattern that we have um, detected at least. Um, overall, there are 81 regions with the false discovery rate of 0.02. They fall into about 42 different clusters, but only represent a really tiny proportion of the genome. Most of the genome shows patterns of isolation by distance. If you were to take these regions and their nearby genes and run it through a gene ontology analysis, you could see enrichment for interesting um, categories. Um, however, I'm deeply skeptical about that analysis for obvious reasons, not least that um, the annotations for those analyses come from mouse or humans or other fish and we actually don't know what they're doing in sticklebacks, which I think is why it's important to do the functional dissection. Okay, so um, that's a whiz summary of the patterns that we've observed. You know, using this approach, we, we know what loci underlie parallel marine freshwater divergence, but we actually still don't know how they connect to phenotype or fitness in any way. So one question would be, um, can we actually link some of these peaks to fitness and reproductive isolation? And to tell you about this, I have to dig back through my PhD work in Edinburgh, where I studied a hybrid zone um, between marine and freshwater fish. And I was trying to identify where the reproductive barriers that were maintaining divergence between these different forms. 
I studied pre-mating barriers and found that actually to be almost non-existent. Um, so if you take individuals from the contact zone and you put them in ponds and let them breed together, for example, there's no evidence of a solitary mating at all. The offspring they produce are completely admixed. In contrast, by following this um, contact zone over time, every month for a period of a year and a half, um, I could actually follow cohorts and genotypes through time and look at their survival of particular genotypes. So I'm going to show you two evidence for the result that we think that this divergence is maintained primarily due to hybrid inferiority. The first one is on the left here. If you were to take body size as a proxy for fitness, which in fish is actually used um, as an indicator as to whether a fish is ready to migrate out to sea. So big fish are ready to migrate, little fish aren't. Individuals of intermediate plate morphology are much smaller in size relative to either forms, the marine or freshwater forms. And so if you're willing to take that as a proxy of fitness, it might be suggestive that the hybrids aren't growing as well in the hybrid zone. And on the right here, by tracking individuals through time, I was able to take a sample of genotypes before winter and after <coughs> winter. And if you just pay attention to this axis here, which is a genetic ancestry or hybrid index, and the z-axis, the probability of surviving winter, you can see that the probability of surviving winter if you're an individual of intermediate genetic ancestry is greatly reduced relative to the marine or freshwater forms. So both of these data suggest that a key <coughs> part of being or diverging into marine or freshwater forms is due to inferiority of the hybrids, but at that stage we didn't even have a genome so I couldn't ask questions about the genetics um, underlying that. Nowadays, um, however, we could actually use the individuals that are admixed in this contact zone, like we use F2 progeny in a four genetic cross, to actually map some of these traits. So to give you a feel for the kind of admixture we see, um, I'm showing you here the results of a structure analysis where the red bars represent uh, marine ancestry and the blue bars are freshwater ancestry. And along the x-axis are thousands of individuals from this um, clinal sample. <coughs> what you can see here from sites four, three, and two is that there's plenty of individuals who overlap. They're both marine and freshwater ancestry, but there's also individuals in there who have intermediate admixture or ancestry. Excuse me. This output from structure gives you this continuous um, measure of genetic ancestry across an individual genome, but you could put it through <coughs> um, different algorithms, such as that by new hybrids, where it get, uh, individuals can be assigned to different um, recombinant classes, such as F1s, F2s, or back crosses. So I'm just plotting structure on the y-axis and new hybrids analysis here. And the only point I wanted to say was that these hybrids are not all F1s. In fact, there are F2s and back crosses present in this sample. And that's essential if you want to use, um, use these individuals for admixture mapping, because the F1s themselves are not informative. Okay, so proof of principle, um, if we actually use individuals from the contact zone to admixture map lateral plate morphology, we see something like this across chromosome 4. So we see a negative log p-value on the y-axis here, and using this is done using a uh, genotyping array. Um, a strong association right in the region that Pam Colosimo had mapped lateral plates to, so that's really exciting. Yay, the approach works. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, we can also map traits that are somewhat less tractable than lab, such as overwinter survival. And when you do this across chromosome 20, for example, we see a strong association with the north end of chromosome 20 and the ability to survive winter. So this is an exciting uh, method by which you can take traits that you know, would be difficult to study in the lab and actually use natural populations to try and tie them to gene regions. And so by doing that, we can start decorating this map with different um, phenotypes that might be influenced by these adaptive loci. Okay, so um, this um, is a mixture of different take-home messages, one of which Michael um, already mentioned, which is the molecular mechanism shaping this adaptive divergence that we're seeing. There was a lot of debate about the role of regulatory encoding changes in um, adaptive evolution. Some people propose that Phenotypic change that's adaptive is more likely to occur by changing the coding sequence because it's going to have a larger phenotypic effect. Other people argued that regulatory elements or intergenic coding sequence might be more important because it avoids the pleiotropy that would occur if you change the protein coding sequence. And there was a lot of debate back then about the importance of these and this stickleback data lets us at least 
see which side of the fence the sticklebacks fall on. And if you were to break these 81 regions down into um, those that fall within coding regions and cause non salonic changes, those that fall either in intergenic space or don't cause any non salonic changes, there's an overwhelming majority of loci that we found that actually do not affect the protein coding sequence. I should point out at this point, um, the stickleback genome is 463 megabase in size, about um, 30 megabase or less of that is exonic coding sequence. So the target size for non-coding uh, mutations is actually quite large. And if you ask whether this 80% representation is more than you would expect based on the representation of non-coding sequence in the genome, the answer is no. So it's not that we're seeing an enrichment for non-coding mutations, it's just that mutations happen everywhere and they get used. Um, right, so um, at the moment with this map we could then really, we're still uh, struggling with the challenge of what the different peaks do, so I wanted to introduce some of the tests that people in my lab are currently working on. Fortunately we can use transgenic techniques to um, test some of these different things and we're using both enhancer assays to look for uh, regulatory elements and also both knock-in and knock-out methods using CRISPR and Talon. Um, I think lots of people seem quite familiar with these approaches, but not so much with the enhancer assay, so I'll briefly describe how we've been doing that. Um, our aim is to take our adaptive locus and hook it up to a reported gene such as a GFP, and we do that by grabbing marine or freshwater bags that carry the sequence of interest and recombinating it upstream of this GFP. We make three different constructs, the freshwater version, the marine version, and then it's empty construct. And then we uh, inject these into a uh, clutch of eggs from sticklebacks. And um, we see patterns something like this. For example, this is a region that um, a master's student in my lab was working on last year. It's 5 KB and it falls between these two genes. When he injects the empty construct, he sees relatively little green fluorescent protein expression. The construct has a positive control which expresses GFP in the eye, so that's how we know they're transgenic. You can see a little bit of muscle fiber background expression um, here. You can also see that his freshwater version actually drives strong GFP in the developing notochord vacuoles. The marine version does have some vacuole expression, but it seems to be much less intense. And we're excited about this particular phenotype because these um, vacuoles are associated with body plan elongation in different um, fish. Marine and freshwater fish differ in size. Um, but in particular, the role of these vacuoles is quite important before the vertebrae have developed. So when fish are really tiny, they need to still maintain structural integrity with their body and they do that by filling these vacuoles up to be quite uh, full of pressure. In Xenopus, um, the vacuoles, the notochord vacuoles, actually respond to changes in osmolarity. And we think that there's potential that there might be different regulatory elements um, for freshwater and marine fish that helps them to maintain their body plan elongation during embryogenesis. That work is still ongoing and we're still doing manipulation, so I apologize, I can't tell you the rest of the story. Um, in the meantime, I'll briefly describe how both Sard and Cecilia are using CRISPR and Talons to knock out and knock in these different loci that we've found. We've got a, a particular aim of trying to freshwaterize the marine genome, and we're doing this at most of those loci that, we've, um, that we identified. So um, there's lots of different approaches that now, now enable us to do custom genome editing. One of them is using Talons, the other is a, a Cas9 a nuclease. Um, both involve basically designing um, a nuclease to target a specific location in the genome, and they can introduce either single-stranded or double-stranded breaks at the targeted locus. With that break, you can either rely on the cell doing its own non-homologous end joining to repair the mechanism to introduce a deletion, or if you co-inject with either single-stranded or homologous um, arms, you can actually knock in other um, loci. So that's something that's also still ongoing at the moment. Okay, so um, one of the other patterns that we noticed in our genomic data set was that there are at least three large inversions that seem to differ in orientation between marine and freshwater fish. This is um, a pattern that has been observed in many organisms. Inversions are meant to, are thought to be important because they have the potential to trap co-adaptive loci together or alleles together 
in a region that sh shuts down recombination. So when these two orientations come together in a heterozygote, there's actually a suppression of recombination that prevents the marine and freshwater alleles from getting mixed up and maintains divergence between forms. So inversions have been shown in many incipient, incipient species pairs, including Mimulus and Ragolitus and the, um, the butterflies as well. Um, but it sets up the general principle that recombination suppression might be quite important for maintaining divergence between forms. And so we could ask with our data set, um, what about other recombination cold spots in the genome? And because we've done so much forward genetic mapping in um, our community, we're able to make or take these genetic maps and actually build somewhat crude megabase scale estimates of recombination rate across the genome. So I'm showing you here, um, the y-axis here is the centimorgan map from say chromosome 4 in this case, and the x-axis is the physical genome assembly. And you can see there are many centimorgans at the start and at the end of this um, chromosome and not so many centimorgans in the middle meaning there is a lot of crossing over and recombination at the ends and less in the middle. So you can use the lowest regression to estimate recombination rate and you see, um, you, can, yeah, you can see elevated recombination rate in this chromosome at the ends. Um, this pattern does not always apply to all chromosomes and sticklebacks is quite a heterogeneous mix of metacentric and telocentric chromosomes. So the landscape of recombination differs across each chromosome. One pattern we did notice was, was that the um, recombination varies considerably between sexes. So the female genetic map is quite long re relative to the male genetic map. Um, I told you it varies considerably across the chromosomes, but you also see um, that the marine freshwater adaptive loci tend to fall in these regions of low recombination. And that's just an indication that yes, the recombination landscape is shaping which bits of genetic variation are being used to maintain divergence between forms. Um, but it fits nicely with some theoretical work that was done back in the 70s by Brian and Deborah Childworth, also more recently by Nick Barton, which has shown that um, selection will favour a recombination suppressor when there's contact and high levels of gene flow between divergence forms. That's because the production of recombinants actually results in deleterious combination of alleles. So any mechanism that shuts down recombination between divergent forms should be favoured. And with that, um, we are actually just starting a brand new grant, uh, grant to actually study recombination and adaptive evolution. And we're actually going to be studying with really high resolution the recombination maps for marine and freshwater forms and testing for this suppression in hybrids. We're also hoping ambitiously to map recombination modifiers and then influence recombination <coughs> using transgenic techniques to force recombination to occur in particular locations or to shut it down in the genome. Okay, so um, with the last 10 minutes I think I've got, um, I tried to briefly introduce um, some of the newish data we've got on comparative genomics of different species pairs. So you've heard a lot today about marine and freshwater forms, but I told you already that there are some um, forms which are the benthic and limnetic morphs that coexist in some lakes in British Columbia. Um, so these fish are interesting because they're only found in five or four or five lakes in this small area of the world. And despite much researchers' efforts and attentions, they have not really been located anywhere else. They are um, different forms that coexist. The benthic form eats off the benthos. The limetic form tends to eat food that floats up in the water. And as I mentioned, the degree of reproductive isolation is quite strong. Uh, they do hybridize, but the <coughs> frequency of hybridization is very rare. It is thought that these fish evolved through the process of a double invasion event. When the Pleistocene ice cap retreated, you know, land masses bounced up and down due to the weight of the ice being um, lifted. Initially a, uh, initially, a freshwater wave happened, and this form evolved to be a benthic form. Then some 6,000 years later, a limnetic form, uh, form is thought to have um, invaded a second time due to the bouncing of the land mass due to isostatic rebound. And so, um, and so, right, so now today you can see within a single lake fish that look something like this. These are both <coughs> rounded females, and the benthic form is considerably larger than the small <coughs> limetic form. Um, so, what do we know about the genetics underlying this um, particular ecotypic divergence? It's happened at least 
the present day we have access to four different lakes that are still um, sample, uh, samples from four different lakes. Um, if you were to look at neutral genetic variation um, among these populations, I'm just showing a principal components analysis of this. You can see that the benthic and limnetic forms from each lake group together um, and are quite distinct from other lakes. So that's um, what you might expect. Um, I wanted to set this up so um, you can take the loadings or the, from the eigenvectors of this analysis, grab a whole bunch of other populations from around the world and project them onto this space to ask where in the world are there any other populations that look like this. So, crude analysis to identify this potential source of these different forms. So when you do that, um, you see something very unimpressive, <laughs> like this. Um, if you take global 40 populations from around the world and project them into the ethnic limnetic space, there's absolutely no signature of a colonizing source um, at, at all, at least at these neutral loci. Okay, so then um, you can... <coughs> Analyze these populations for FST outliers. So I should mention, that I forgot to say, this is all based on a pretty crude low density SNP genotyping array. Um, regardless, you can take this, um, you can take these populations and look for FST outliers. And when you do that, you can um, find something that looks like this. So a principal components analysis, just based on the 40 or 50 odd outlier SNPs that were identified shows a major axis of variation, explaining 65% of the variation, that separates limnetic forms from benthic forms. So that indicates that at least a large proportion of the divergence between the ecotypic pairs is diverging in parallel, insofar as the limnetic forms are moving in the same direction away from the benthic forms. And now if you take your global populations, project them onto that principal component space, we might be able to get an idea of where the adaptive variation is that's mediating um, this particular split, or at least where it came from. And so when you do that, you see something like this. So in blue with freshwater populations, and you can see there are three populations I've labeled here that fall closely to the benthic forms. The red populations are marine, and they seem to cluster on the limnetic end of the axis. So um, I thought this was an interesting result because it indicates that the evolution of the benthic forms may have primarily involved genetic variation that was already existing at least in other populations. Um, and as I mentioned, this was based on a pretty crude SNP genotyping array. And of course, since then, we've done a lot more genomic sequencing. So we now have 48 genomes um, from each of these fish, uh, six fish from each of these uh, different lakes. And um, a PhD student in my lab who's literally only just joined, and this might have been one of the first plots he ever made. <laughs> has made this pattern of parallel benthic limnetic divergence across the genome. So similar to what we see in the marine freshwater split, these ecotypic pairs involve many different chromosomes, but some chromosomes are not involved at all. Uh, that's for the pattern of parallel divergence, I guess. Um, it was noticeable to us, and I apologize that these plots are not so um, uh, put together so well yet, because Mukwa has literally only been here for a few weeks. But, um, um, we noticed that a lot of these peaks um, coincided with the marine freshwater split that I showed you earlier. And in fact, if you overlay them on parallel divergence in marine freshwater forms, you can see there are regions where the benthic limnetic divergence actually corresponds pretty well to the marine freshwater splits. There are also places where um, there's marine freshwater split that the benthic limnetic fish do not have, and vice versa, the benthic limnetic fish have diverged in places where the marine freshwater fish have not. So, and I I've not formally quantified this yet, but obviously looking at the degree of adaptive divergence that has occurred by a reuse of marine freshwater variation is actually a very interesting um, question. Um, right. So one, one analysis that was quick to do that I could do on the plane here <laughs> is um, when the same loci are involved for the benthic limnetic splits and the marine freshwater splits is we can actually try to identify where those alleles came from using an Ababa test. So for those of you who are not familiar, the Ababa test is describing two different tree topologies, an Ababa topology and a Baba topology. You can imagine a situation where you have ancestral genetic variation of an A and a B allele segregating. When benthic limnetic forms evolve, they could either make use of the B allele or the A allele. And the only difference between these two trees is that switch the, here, the benthic allele is, the limnetic allele is using the B allele. We can actually count 
the relative representation of these two trees across the genome, if um, adaptation or divergence between these forms was just making use of any kind of standard genetic variation in no particular fashion, we would expect this tree to be as common as this tree. If, however, benthic forms are really making use of always freshwater forms from nearby, for example, we might expect the ABBA tree to be much more common than the ABBA tree. So on the plane, counting ABBA babbas, the axis is something like this. Overwhelming signal for an ABBA topology where the benthic forms are always making use of genetic variation from nearby freshwater populations. I should stress again one more time that this is at loci where this allele is already segregating a standing genetic variation. Obviously, mediating this split is a whole bunch of loci that might be unique to the lakes, and this test does not look at that at all. Okay. Um, but one of the take home messages really is that, um, as we've heard from the marine freshwater story already and from the eat allele, for example, is that standing genetic variation really is um, seeming to play an important role in rapid adaptation. And um, I showed you how we think this happens by the shuttling of alleles through this marine environment. What we don't know is much about what that standing genetic variation looks like. And I think to be able to really model how adaptive uh, selective sweeps occur in a freshwater population, we need to know a lot more about the freshwater adaptive alleles that are actually already segregating in the marine environment. Um, so some of the questions that we would like to answer are, what does the standing genetic variation look like? How many freshwater adaptive alleles does a marine fish carry? What's the extent of LD among these alleles? And how does the freshwater adaptive allele uh, locus decay over time? This hap haplotype lock size that's present in the marine environment can tell us a lot about how long it stays there and how often it um, is being introgressed. We do have some data, at least to answer a little bit of this question of the LD among the different loci. So Craig, who's here actually, in the back of the room somewhere, studied um, LD amongst Eder and Kit Ligon. Kit Ligon is a locus that underlies pigmentation variation. In a marine sample of around 214 fish, and found essentially no LD at all, suggesting that um, marine fish that carry the freshwater eater locus are not certainly carrying multiple other um, adaptive loci in this not a kid ligand. In contrast, a more recent Sorry, are, those, are those near each other on the genome? Or? No, these are on different chromosomes. Oh, okay. So they're not all F1s, I guess would be the take home <laughs> from this. They're not individuals just wholesale swimming around the coast, at least based on that sample. Um, um, in contrast, Paul Hohenlohe actually did a more recent study. His was a little bit strange insofar as he took 32 fish, but they were pooled from two different populations, and then looked for LD amongst loci, and he found per pervasive LD amongst the different adaptive marine freshwater loci. I think that the pooling of the two different populations has the potential to be a real confounder here. So I'm not sure how to kind of match the results from Craig's study with Paul's, but um, I think it needs to be um, looked at more carefully. Um, and obviously to study this, we're talking about rare genetic variation, we kind of need a lot of cash to be able to genotype or sequence hundreds of fish, and so we need to come up with a way of doing that. I designed a cost-effective SNP genotyping array which has 384 SNPs. It tags um, these 81 loci plus some neutral loci across the genome. And the plan is to run this on um, many thousands of marine fish. I wanted to show you some preliminary data from just a subset of 150 of those at five different loci across the genome. I don't know if you can see this, it's quite small. Um, the black, the color scheme throughout the talk, the marine fish have been color coded as um, homozygous um, marine allele is red, homozygous for the freshwater allele is blue, and individuals who are heterozygous are yellow. So if you look at these different loci, you might be able to spot individuals who are carrying at least the freshwater allele in heterozygous form, and one individual is carrying the freshwater allele in homozygous form at least two loci. And the frequency of this variation, at least at these loci, ranges from 1.3 through to 10%. But you can see, as I've mentioned earlier, these are not all just F1s. They're actually representing multi-generational back crosses to be able to get a freshwater genome and break it down into these different parts. That suggests they're persisting in the marine environment long enough to be broken down. Um, and obviously the next step would be to sequence some of these to actually look at that decay of haplotype block size. Um, what we can ask is from this pilot data set is 
how many how many freshwater adaptive alleles does a marine individual carry? So that's plotted across here. Um, and most of the individuals aren't carrying any freshwater adaptive alleles. Some of them carry one. A very small proportion carry more than one. In this case, there's this individual here who's carrying as many as six freshwater adaptive alleles. So the genetic load on that individual, in theory, would be quite high. So either um, that, so you can actually use this shape of this distribution to test whether this is overrepresented or underrepresented. I haven't done that analysis yet, but um, either this is represents a true genetic load for this individual, or there's some modifiers that are actually enabling these alleles to hide in the marine environment. And so by analysing these in many more fish, we should be able to get an idea of what's going on there. And then briefly, just to revisit that LD question, <laughs> add some even less convincing data than what Craig and, uh, and Paul already showed, the LD amongst these different loci actually shows very, very relatively weak LD except between lo lockers 3 and 5, also on different chromosomes. Um, but I think this analysis can actually help us understand when an invasion occurs, what kind of loci are likely to be swept together during that process. Whew. Okay, so I have, um, just going to finish up, I have told you today about how we've used QTL mapping, whole genome sequencing, and admixture mapping to try to identify loci underlying different traits in different populations. I told you how we found um, most of the adaptive loci fall in non-coding parts of the genome, and that we think the recombination landscape really is important in shaping which parts of the variation get swept in this divergence. And I showed you a little bit of the new data from the benthic limetic um, analysis, which suggests that the split between benthic limetic forms does at least make use of existing variation that's already divergent between marine and freshwater ecotypes. Okay, and with that, I'll just finish and say thank you to all the people in my lab. We interact every day on a daily basis with Frank Chan's lab. Um, much of the data you saw today was generated when I was a postdoc in David's lab. And um, Shannon Brady was the fantastic technician at the time. She and I fought with the GA2 every week to get generate genome sequence data. Um, the Benthic Limetic Project is a collaboration with Dolph Schluter. We have um, many marine fish from Mike Bell. You saw some PhD data from my time in Edinburgh. And obviously, um, two genome centers have helped us generate all this fantastic data. That's from Sherston Lindblad-Toe's group at Broad and Rick Meyer's group at Abs and Alpha. So Follow City. So studies from the 80s suggest that they tend to leave around three or four months of age. So they don't, they tend, they tend not to overwinter the first year in freshwater like the salmon or a lot of my fish, but they tend to go straight away. Follow well, that. Uh, are you might not know this? Then are the hybrids? Do, are they anadromous or resident? Ah, so we're actually doing some admixture mapping on isotopes at the moment to actually answer that question. Um, we don't know. But I think by looking at the strontium calcium ratios in their bones, we should be able to tell whether they've been to sea or not and also associate that with particular loci. So yeah. I'll let you know the results when it's ready. Um, in the PC analysis of the benthic and limetic uh, forms, you, uh, you said that you thought that what has happened is a double invasion. Mm -hmm. But it seems also possible that you've got ecological species formation taking place in situ. How would you distinguish between those two? Right, so actually um, this is work done by Dolph, so you can ask him in the comments, yeah. and also Taylor and McPhail um, back in the early 90s. Right. Um, they were able to look at the degree of genetic variation present in limnetics versus the benthics, and inferred that the benthics had been there first, and then the limnetics <coughs> invaded afterwards. It's just that they're so close together. Yeah. They, they, they so closely. Yeah, and um, the interpretation that's often given to that is that the hybridization, even if it occurs only at one percent, is still a significant rate that would homogenize a neutral lockers quite efficiently. Mm -hmm. So that's. Yeah. So in the example you gave with the notochord enhancer and the different levels of expression. So I might have missed it. I'm sorry. Do you know what the coding region is nearby? What kind yeah, yeah. So actually, <laughs> both of them are both the most unexciting genes nearby. One of them is P21, and the other one is some kind of um, transporter 
of sugar, a sugar transfer. But that might make perhaps. some sense, right? Right, yeah, perhaps. But we don't know. And those are done in zebrafish? That was a zebrafish picture. I was wondering who would pick that up. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> <laughs> this was before the fish room was finished. So actually, that was last year in William's work. And so since then, we've just repeated the whole experiment. Stickleback and I totally forgot to change the slide, but it's essentially the same. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at the, the 81 uh, tentatively adopted and divergent regions, um, either by like, comparing the results <coughs> in the HMM and the um, distance matrix or by some other means, can you tell or have some confidence in which ones were from standing genetic variation and which ones might have been due to parallel, like independent, distinct changes in the same regions? And if you can, are there any different patterns in those groups? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, one thing I did not mention was that um, for most of these regions, they're extremely divergent. They contain many, many SNPs, so up to a 4% divergent rate. And if you use geological phenomena to actually put a molecular clock on that, these alleles date back to somewhere between 2 and 3 million years of age. So this is really old variation that's been obviously reused more recently in the last 10,000 years. Um, but your second, so the question about which of these actually, which of the 81 might be from standing genetic variation versus de novo, both of these statistics are very good at detecting the standing genetic variation because it's such a strong signature. If it was de novo, we probably would not expect to see parallelism in that de novo mutation. And if it did occur across these pairs, I don't think there would be many SNPs in the window that would have yet accumulated in parallel. So I think it's unlikely that we would find any of these 81 to be de novo. So we use different methods to do that. <laughs> And so we've sequenced multiple different individuals from each of these populations now and have got replicate hybrid zone pairs, I guess, to actually address that question. And it's looking like, the latest statistics are looking like actually a really large proportion are making use of standing genetic variation. And I think in this, in this genome paper, I estimate about 33% was coming from standing genetic variation. And I think now my new data is suggesting it's much, much higher, like 70%. Well, this transporter idea um, argues that the adaptive mutations should come from some stream, go into the ocean, and then go up other streams, right? Is that in the? Is there evidence of where that might be? Are there? And is there other sampling in other marine sites that might have a higher frequency? Or is the argument basically the observation that it should be deleterious in the marine environment, so it must come from nearby streams? Right. So the statistic simple? kind of tests for this uh, maximal divergence, so it kind of requires that it's at low frequency in the marine environment. Um, whether it's deleterious or not, that's another thing. It could arise in the marine and be swept, but like I just mentioned, some of these are just really old and contain many mutations, and for that to have happened, um, uh, I've forgotten what my point was, but um, I was going to say each time it gets swept, it has the potential to be improved. Like hitchhikers on either side that even make a small modification can um, improve this allele over two or three million years of age. So, um, and I can't remember, um, where do they come from? Um, we are starting to do some haplotype block analysis to look at the, where the breakdown of the block is in the world. So you expect it might be large when it comes from a source and over time gets broken down into smaller pieces. Um, and so that's still ongoing, um, but maybe I'll tell you about that next time. We suspect it's from at least several different sources, although the mo major signal is the Pacific Northwest. But, but during the last glacial advance, what, were there freshwater populations of sticklebacks in unglaciated areas? Like, I mean, there are sticklebacks in El Cerrito Creek. Now, right, and there's sticklebacks down in Baja, Baja, so there must be unglaciated sticklebacks. There could have been sources, that's right. So there may have been continuous sources. Right. right. But um, wouldn't it require a high level of gene flow across the world to get these things? I know, it's crazy, right? I mean, yeah, I mean what, so it's surprising. I mean, these alleles have spread from the Pacific through to the Atlantic, yeah, but they've had two to three million years to do it. Yeah. And by the time they get to Atlantic, they are, t most of them, majority of them are really tiny pieces. Hmm. So. Is there any chance that there could be balance of selection in the marine environment, that, that environment is very heterogeneous, so because of spatial structure and so on? Yeah, um, we haven't, uh, it's not true, we have looked, um, in this statistic, we don't detect the balancing selection within the marine environment, although certainly it could exist. Um, um, but the haplotypes are highly diverged, right? You find these very highly diverged yeah. haplotypes, so that would look just like 
balance of selection on behalf of distinguished. On the big species level, if you include all the ecotypes, certainly this is a pattern of balancing selection. Absolutely, this is what you see. But if you just group it by just the ecotype within marines and ask is there some kind of balancing selection within there that's maintaining the genetic variation, for example, I haven't done the statistics on that one to test. Well, yeah. Um, are uh, sticklebacks expanding their range northward as coastal glaciers disappear? And will you be able to detect an instance, a first instance? Yeah, of this? Uh, oh, there's two, two great um, groups who've got their hands on the gold. Um, so one of them is Bill Cresco's group up in Oregon, and they have studied um, an island that has just formed off the coast of Alaska, which has got some now freshwater ponds that have been invaded in the last, since the earthquake in 1956, I might get the year wrong, but in the last 50 years. So they are busy studying that population, I think good things will come out of that. The second one is from Mike Fell's group over in Stony, Bro Stony Brook, and he studies Alaskan populations which have been poisoned by the Alaskan Fish and Games to empty a lake so they can seed it with their favorite fish of choice. So he's got the known date of poisoning, and then um, he has, initially the first lake that happened, it just happened to get colonized by stickleback and no one knows how, but has shown rapid transitions in allele frequencies that we can estimate selections on. Then more recently he collaborates with Fish and Game so that he, they poison and then he seeds. And now we've got some pretty rapid contemporary evolution going on. But those selection coefficients from the, at least from the Alaskan populations are coming up to be extremely high. So um, the selection coefficient on Eater is 0.7 and on one of the loci on linkage group 1 is 0.3. So are the, that, as a follow up, are the patterns here that are being observed in these new instances approximately the same as the patterns further south that are right. of long standing? Ah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, we've sequenced the genomes of some of these contemporary evolution populations, and I, I don't know the answer yet. Um, but with regards to whether we might expect to see different loci being selected, yeah, it's possible. Um, yeah, just don't know. Maybe one more? Just one more. I'm thinking of Jay Scholar's work on evolution of um, hemoglobin genes in high altitude vertebrates. And he's been finding that within um, a given gene, you can get different substitutions in amino acids that will have different fitness effects depending on the order in which they occur because of extraterritic interactions. And do you think that that could make it more likely that de novo mutations will take the same evolutionary path because of extraterritic interactions with other genes? Maybe it can't count. Um, I have absolutely no way of answering that question, but um, but yeah, I mean it's possible. Um, we are looking for some of these signatures of de novo mutation sweeps in some populations, so maybe we'll get an idea at least what the haplotype looks like. But as for the whether the mutations occur in the same way, because maybe once you already have one freshwater allele, then you need something else right. to counter right. biotropic effects of that yeah. allele, yeah. and so you'll be very strongly selected. And I think that marine, many marine experiment, I think, could also show some interesting patterns of um, potential LD or epistasis among these alleles. The ability to hide in the marine environment and travel and stay there long enough to get broken down into a small piece might be because you have, you know, the associated modifiers that let you hide, for example, or your, yeah. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much.